here. How awesome is our God?
please remain standing. We serve a great God, and we are here to praise his holy name together. We've called this Friends Day, and uh, we've invited all, all our friends to come and be with us. And, and those of you that are here for the first time, thank you for being with us. Please get a bulletin. Please um, fill out that communication card in your bulletin and let me have that before you leave. We want to get to know you. We want to meet you. Um, in fact, let me just ask you, if you're a newcomer to Kingsland, you've come today for the first time or maybe just in the last few weeks for this fall for the first time, uh, who are you? Raise your hand real quick if you're new to Kingsland. We're so thankful that you're here. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being here. In fact, we want to we meet you and know you, so let's turn around, introduce yourself to those folks, and uh, shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, let them know how happy you are that they're here worshiping with us today. I've never heard that. That's good. Let's sing all together now. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the only righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom. And we
Heaven's mercy. 
pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Lord, I, my prayer this morning is that we are indeed filled with awestruck wonder just at the mention of your name. Lord, such power you have, such grace, such love. You are that mighty fortress that we can rest upon, that will give us rest, that will give us refuge, that loves us no matter how bad we are, no matter what we do. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we pray right now that you use these tithes and offerings for your glory, for your kingdom. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The sing this third verse together.
be seated. Are, are you thankful this morning for the deep, deep love of God? What a beautiful song. What a beautiful reminder of God's awesome love for us. You know, he wants to be our friend. He wants to be your friend. Jesus said, uh, there's no love like this than that a man would lay down his life for his friend. And that's exactly what he did. He, the, the, the Bible story we're going to read this morning is just a couple days before Jesus died on the cross. When he made that statement, there's no greater love than this, that a, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he wanted friendship with you and with me. He wants to be your best friend. So on friend day at Kingsland, let's be reminded about the most important friendship there is, and that is our friendship with God. And he gave us all these visual reminders of friends. Um, I, I, I love my friends. My wife is my very best friend. I have friends all around me in this room this morning. You're my friend. And, 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 and God, God gives us this special connection with, with each other, but it's just a, a small taste of what we can have with him. Some of you are not married today. You don't have a husband-wife friendship this morning. You know what? That's okay. You have a friendship with God. Even if you are married, your primary friendship, your number one relationship is with God. Um, and, and someday you may, will, will be married and have that best friend. Or maybe you have a, maybe you're younger in, in, in high school and you got a best buddy, a best friend. And can you remember your best friend in, in, in school, maybe in elementary school? Um, how many of you still have your best friend from elementary school? Raise your hand. Man, that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm very jealous of you. I, I, I don't um, have my best friend from elementary school. I, I can't think of that, that, that being the case. But, you know, friendship is important. God gave us these relationships as just a small taste of what we can have with him. And we all want friendships. I mean, it, so much so, friendship is something we can all relate to, to where they made a, an entire television show and what they call it. Friends. Dumbest show ever on TV. Um, friends. But even shows that aren't called that are all about what? What was Seinfeld all about? Four or five goofy, neurotic friends. Go all the way back to I Love Lucy. What was I Lucy, Love Lucy all about? It was the Mertzids and the, the Ricardos, and they were friends. And everybody related to that. And the Honeymooners. And, 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 and um, we, we all relate to wanting to have those friendships. And God gave us a, a, a void in our hearts that, that, that friendships fill, but only really, ultimately, a friendship with him right? I mean, and, and who's your best friend? What would they do for you? Uh, you know, I, I love the, the joke about the, the husband and the wife that went to the doctor. He was sick. The doctor examined him. He was so bad off. He said, you need to leave the room. And he, and he talked to his, his, the wife. It was just the doctor and the wife. And he said, ma'am, your husband has a really bad case of some, some, something, something. And, um, and, and it, 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 the only way it's going to be cured, the only way this man can be cured is for six months of intensive wife therapy. And, and you're going to have to make him breakfast in bed every day for six months and, and feed him a big, nice lunch and a big dinner and rub his feet and massage his back and make yourself available to him in every way for the next six months. And, and, and just, you, it, 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 his life's dependent on it. And, um, and she said, okay, doctor. And she walked out of the room and, and her husband's like, what did he say? And she said, sorry, husband, you're gonna die. <laughs> So obviously she wasn't much of a friend, right? Um, hopefully we would, we would love our spouse or love our brother. You know, I've, I've been through things, things over the last year and years with friends that I never thought I would. And, and, and you really realize we are here. We are the hands and feet of Christ. We do lift each other up. And, and, and really when you're best friends, when you're really best friends, you're invested to the point where you're all in. And that is what we should be looking for in our relationship with Jesus. Turn over to Mark chapter 12. And um, we, will, we will see this, that a genuine love for God completely changes us. And it's revealed by an all-in mentality. You may have a friend that you're, you know, all in with that, well, or a spouse. Or, but really, the ultimate example of friendship is a friendship that we can have with God. And we want to be all in with him. Last night, um, the church gave my wife and I tickets to go see Stephen Curtis Chapman in concert. My wife and I went, and we just had an incredible experience. It was, it was powerful. It was beautiful. The Word of God was, was delivered. The songs, the, the, the whole thing was awesome. But he didn't sing one song that I didn't expect him to sing, but we actually had it in our wedding, and it's called Faithful Friend. I will be your faithful friend. He sang that song back in the 1990s with Twyla Paris. It was the number one hit 20 years ago. But, um, and, we, and we did. We had that in our wedding. And, and, and because it's taught, met two people 
on a human level, having friendship, which, which we're going to talk about that a little bit today in, 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 from this text, but ultimately, those friendships point to a friendship with God. And when you have a love relationship with God, it changes you. And please remember, we're not talking about behavior modification this morning. We're not talking about if you give enough money to the church or if you do enough good deeds. In fact, this, this story is going to hit some of that to where you could never give enough money to buy your way to heaven. You could never come to church enough. You could never be good enough. It's not about that. It's about having a relationship. How many of you had to pay to be friends with your best friend? I mean, all of us have friends and we end up paying in certain ways, right? But, but, but you didn't like say, here's a hundred bucks, be my buddy. I mean, hopefully, maybe in, in middle school you might have tried that. But, uh, you know, th- if someone came up to you and tried that, you'd be like, man, that, that's the exact opposite of, of being a friend. I mean, if a, if a friend did that, you'd be like, what's wrong with you? Here's a hundred dollars, whatever you need. You're my friend. I love you. We get, it, we get it backwards, don't we? And when it comes to Jesus, are you all in in that friendship? Are you holding on for something better? Are you, are you mostly in? See, that's the problem. When you're mostly in, that's the most miserable place to be to mostly be in with God. Christianity is an all-in proposition. God is not interested in 99% of you any more than your spouse is interested in 99% of you. He wants all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your life, your future, your values, your energy, your resources. He wants you to be all in, and it starts with the heart. It starts with, it's a fa- when it comes to God, it's a father-son relationship. When it comes to God the, son, God the Father, God the Son, it's a, it's a brotherly relationship. And with the Spirit of God, it's an intimate, inward, in-your-heart relationship. And in the text we have here, in Mark chapter 12, we see um, God, Jesus identifies what's most important. Look at verse 29. What's most important, the greatest command in verse 29. What matters most? What's it all about? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's what God wants from you. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him more than you love your spouse, if you have one. He wants you to love him more than you love your girlfriend or your boyfriend, if you have one, or your, or your buddy or your best friend. And there's so many of us that think, if, it, if I just had a better relationship with my husband or wife, or if I just had one, or if I had a girlfriend, or if I had, if I had a best friend, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. What life is all about, the most important thing is you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind, everything you are. And a genuine love for God produces an all-in mindset. We know that. We, I think we can relate to that. that. That when you love him that way, it's 100%. It's all out, just like when you lo- love another person. Now, what does that look like? How is it revealed? I want to show you four ways in this little passage you're going to read how it's revealed. Number one, and if you're taking notes, it's number one in your bulletins, a love for others. A love for others. So how, if, if, if you love God... What's it going to look like? You're going to love others. Now, let's not get it confused. Just because you love others doesn't mean you don't love God. There's a lot of godless people out there that have no relationship with God whatsoever. They love their wife. They love their kids. They love people. Don't get it backwards. When you love God, it's going to reveal itself in a love for others. Back to that song. I will be your faithful friend. You're going to care about people. You're going to care about your community. And, and, And two weeks ago, we talked about our civic obligations, didn't we? Render under Caesar that which is Caesar's, render under God that which is God's. Um, be a, be a, um, an active citizen. On Tuesday, you'll have an opportunity to vote. Love others. What does that mean? Get involved. Thank God we live in a, a republic. We live in a constitutional um, a, a, a democracy, a republic, where we, we, the people, are involved in the process. We don't have a king. We can put people in and out of office with our vote. Get involved. Who do you vote for? Well, pe- vote for people that love others. How, how do you show whether or not you love others? Well, you care about them. Uh, and, and, and if you were in the same lesson we were in in Sunday school this morning, it talked about being judgmental and, and how God is the judge, and we, we don't have to be a judge. But you know, anytime you point out anything that's wrong, you're going to be accused of being judgmental. Well, you're hateful. Why are you hateful? Because you said, I couldn't do whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> well, I, if that makes me hateful. So love others. That means vote. Vote for someone who, who is going to defend life in the womb. Vote for someone who's going to stand for biblical marriage. Vote for somebody uh, or a man or a woman who most lines up with what we read in the Word of God. And when you're done doing that, pray for whoever wins, regardless of whether or not you voted for them. When they're put into office, you, vote for, you, you pray for them and you, and you concern yourself with them. If we love our others, if we love our community, if we love our world, if we love our country, we're going to get involved. Um, on, on Thursday, we had our fall festival. 
Boy, that, that's just love others right there. Just love, love this neighborhood. Love this neighborhood. Love this community. If you served at the fall festival in any way, if you participated in any way in the fall festival, I want you to raise your hand. Thank you. Man, look at all those hands. Give them a hand. Thank you for doing that. Man, that's awesome. That blesses my heart. That's a lot of hands. I only thought it was like 10 of us, but it look, looks, looks like there's a lot more than that. Um, and we got big plans for next year's fall festival, how we can take the gospel into the woods on the hayride. I'm excited about that. Why? Because we love people. We love others. We want to introduce them to Jesus. A lady prayed to receive Christ on Wednesday night or on Thursday night through our fall festival. And I'm hoping that many more will. We'll go back and in and, and a couple Sundays, we'll go back to, to, to Monroe Park and serve and feed the, the, the hung, hungry and, and give clothes to people who need clothes. Why? Because we love others. On that day, we'll visit people who visited us at the fall festival. And we'll send them letters and we'll write them. We'll contact them. Why? Because we love others. Why are we doing friend day? Because we love people. And we want people to know Jesus. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Then in, 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 in verse 31, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love others. Moving forward, number two. How is this love relationship with Christ revealed? Secondly, intimacy with Christ. Intimacy with Christ. And I'm going to do something here that, that it, 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 I might lose you because I'll be honest with you, I was 20 years old, 20 years ago in Bible Institute well, it was the first time I really somewhat understood these next few verses. Look at verse 37. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Stop. Having intimacy with Christ starts with acknowledging who Christ is. And what does that have to do? The Lord said to my Lord, da he says, what, and Jesus is quoting David. It's a direct quote from Psalm 110, which is a messianic psalm, a royal psalm, a psalm that could not have possibly been just about a man, about David, or about his great-grandson. Go to Psalm 110, and, and if, if you want to try, maybe you can try to grasp this with me. And I'm not saying I have it completely grasped, but turn over to Psalm 110 and look at this text where Jesus is referring Psalm 110, it's easy, right in the middle of your Bible. Flip on over there. Not hearing enough Bibles turn. Did you bring your Bible today? Bring your Bible to church, please. Turn to Psalm 110 in your Bible. Or click over in your cell phone or something. I won't read the whole psalm, but this is a royal psalm. This is a messianic psalm. And this gives us a little better idea of what, in the, what is Jesus referring to when he refers back to this psalm that says, he says, David, why did David call him Lord. He's saying that the Messiah, the son of David, was going to be much more than just a king or a human. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Verse 2, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Now we have this Messiah who is ruling. You can't fault the early first century Jews for missing the Messiah completely. They were looking for a ruler. They were, they were looking for a king. They were looking for a, a revolutionary to save them, to get, get the Roman government off their back. And they knew that their Messiah would rule and reign, and he will. He rules and reigns in our hearts today through the presence of the Holy Spirit. But there's coming a day when he will return, and he will rule and reign physically on this earth. We need to be ready for that. Christ could return right now. And the thing they were hoping for a 1,000 years before the time of Christ, we are hoping now 2,000 years after Christ came. Look at verse 4. This is interesting. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Does that name mean anything to anybody? Melchizedek. That's not probably one you heard at work this week. Melchizedek. Melchizedek is the king that Abraham met and, and actually gave tithes to, before the Old Testament law was ever put in place, Abraham tithed to this priest. who they, He had no mom, no dad. They, he, they, they didn't know where he came from. This is an Old Testament type of Christ. When you read Hebrews, you find out that Melchizedek, Melchizedek represented, in a, in a sense, Christ. No dad, didn't know where he came from. This mysterious figure. And he's saying the Messiah will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Jesus is saying, hey, everybody, that's me. I'm the guy. I'm the one you waited for. And, and, and David referred to him as Lord. So back to Mark chapter 12. Let's, we'll, we'll keep you there the rest of the day, I promise. Flip over back to Mark chapter 12. Jesus is, is connecting the dots for these religious scholars from David a thousand years earlier about the Messiah. He's claiming deity as Messiah. 
Do you have any idea who Jesus is? Do you have any idea who this, this figure, this, this, this person that people talk about, that, that, that churches supposedly worship? Jesus wants a relationship with you. He wants friendship with you. When we understand he's God, he's deity, he, he came and made himself a man, fully God, fully man, man, we should desire intimacy with Christ. And there are many well-meaning people who sincerely believe that all roads lead to God. You've heard that before. All roads lead to God. Various religions and religious leaders can all be right at the same time, even though they contradict with one another. Now, a fifth grader can figure out something's wrong with that. You can't be right if you both completely contradict and disagree. God has a name. His name's Jehovah. The truth is there's only one God, Jehovah God. There's only one mediator between God and man. That's Jesus, the Son. And our priority is to give God glory and to, to develop a passionate, intimate, meaningful relationship with the Father through the Son by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. There's no substitute for quiet time, ladies and gentlemen. There's no substitute for having time with God and all the good deeds, all the serving in this and doing that and giving this and showing up for that and leading this and teaching that. None of it. It's of little consequence without intimacy. Man, we need to be reminded that. Love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. That means, how, what's that look like? Where well, you're going to love others and you're going to have an intimate walk with him. You're going to know him. You're going to listen to him. How do you hear him? Right here. He talks to you right here through his word. It's black and white. It's very clear. It's very convicting. He talks to us of the Holy Spirit in our lives. His Holy Spirit illuminates the scriptures so we can read them. Maybe you're reading this passage for the first time and you're going, oh, that's what that's about. Jesus was saying, I'm God. If you were in the same Bible study lesson we were in this morning at 930, he says, before Abraham was, say it with me, I am. Man, that's, that's a claim to deity. That's a big deal. And when God, the creator of the universe, knows your name, knows how many hairs you have on your head, which is, you're like me, it's probably a little less than it was the day before, he knows everything about you. He wants a relationship with you. If you love him, you're going to seek intimacy with him. Number three, and this is where it really gets fun. Number three, what's it look like when you have a, a, a love relationship with God? Well, you're going to love others, and, and, and you're going to desire intimacy with Christ. And number three, rejection of religiosity. Someone might want to look that up in the dictionary. Is that word a real word? Religiosity. I've heard it many times. I use it. Hopefully you know what I mean. Fake religion, dead, cold, lifeless religion. A rejection of hypocritical, dead, vain, cold religiosity. To love Jesus is to hate sin. That means to hate perversion, to, to hate um, hypocrisy. Who were the scribes? Look down at verse 38. We're going to read about the scribes. These are the religious lawyers, experts in the law. They, they, they were experts in handling the Torah. They were teachers, and they were self-proclaimed enforcers of the law. Do you know anybody like that in your life that's a self-proclaimed enforcer of the law in your life, and they keep an eye on you? Yeah. They were spiritually blind by their pride, just like many church people today. Are you there in verse 38, back in our text? And in his teaching, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk along, around in long robes and light greetings in the marketplaces, and they have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Ladies and gentlemen, that should scare you to death. If you're a church person, if you're a pastor... I'm going to be honest with you, it scares me to death. I don't want to receive the greater condemnation. I don't want to be the modern version of this with the long flowing robes and sitting in the best seats and, and making prayers for a pretense. We're going to read about how, what, what they do to widows in just a minute. God doesn't like people who mess with widows. It's amazing how he mentions that twice at the end of this chapter. We need to reject religiosity. It has, and I thought about this, if I, can make this, if I can make this illustration, I think it'll mean something to you. The, 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 the connection between Halloween and um, religious people. Religi re and religion's not a bad word. Religion, if you look that word up, it just means devotion. Religion's actually a good word, to be devoted. But to be devoted 
to whatever traditions, whatever, whatever trappings of Christianity that, that, that you've embraced over the years that have nothing to do with the Bible, that's religiosity. Cold, dead, vain religiosity. And I thought about Halloween this week. At Halloween, people dress up and pretend to be something or someone they are not in order to receive candy. And I got a, I got a kick out of all the adults that are participating in Halloween. I guess I didn't know that that was so prevalent. But at Halloween... People dress up and pretend to be something or someone they are not in order to receive candy. It's similar with people who are, are, are stuck in reli religiosity, religious organizations even, churches, church people, dressing up and pretend to, pretending to be something or someone they are not in order to earn God's love or in order to look like somebody or something. And the application I want to say is very direct. Get it out of your life. Get it out of our church. We can't afford it. And these scribes had all the answers. They knew it all. And they were willing to tell everybody else. Hey, and we, we talked about this in class this morning too, the judgmental person. Have you ever judged somebody? I mean, we shouldn't. But have you ever looked down on somebody and looked, I can't believe they did that, and looked down on them and then thought, oh shoot, I did that last week myself. That's how hypocritical we can be. That's how pharisaical we can become if we're not careful. If we love Jesus, we're going to love those people. We're going to seek intimacy with Christ and we're going to reject not the people, not the people. It could be the, the super spiritual religious people or the super religious people or the super perverted people. We don't reject any of them. We love them. They're welcome. Our doors are wide open, especially on friend day. Everybody's our friend. But you know what? We reject that religiosity that says if you can just clean yourself up, God will accept you. I can't believe that person did that. Well, you know what? Believe it. We're sinners. But for the grace of God, you might be doing that. I might be doing that. So we love them. And we love them in the name of Jesus. And, and the more we love Jesus, the easier it's going to be to love people. And to be honest with you, the more we love Jesus, the more we're going to be turned off by any religious trappings that keep people from coming to Jesus. We should be consumed with bringing people to Jesus. Whatever it takes. If it takes a, a, a hayride, let's try it. Number four, and lastly, this story about this widow's mite um, tells me this. If, if, if you are in love with Jesus and you are, you're, you're developing an, an intimate walk with Christ and you know him, you're going to love others and you're going to want to be deeper and closer in your relationship with him the other, than ever and you're not going to want anything to do with dead religion. And lastly, number four, the fourth identifier, the fourth way a love for Jesus and love for God reveals itself, two words, radical generosity. Radical generosity generosity. I was impressed last night at the concert because Stephen Curtis Chapman has an entire adoption ministry and, um, and, and encouraged people to give thousands of dollars to, 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 to bless orphans and to even adopt orphans and to give them child care. And it was, it was a powerful call to, to ministering to people and, and, and to serving people and to giving financially to help people. And it made me think tomorrow is, this is today, last night I was thinking about today. It's our first no service in November. What are we going to be what are we going to be presenting to you for the next two months? Our interna international offering. We're going to have videos. We're going to have talks. We're going to, we're going to encourage you. We're going to have little envelopes you can put money in. And we're going to say, give, 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 give. Why? Well, because there's a tremendous need. We, our missionaries, 5,000 strong, are going to go minister to orphans. Our missionaries are going to go minister to AIDS patients. I can tell you they're going to do that because I've done it. I've been in Africa. I've done it. I've been there. We've prayed for them. We've led them to Jesus. It's an awesome thing to do. And that was just a short little trip. We have 5,000 missionaries that are doing it full time, visiting people in jail, starting churches in people's homes. And, 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 and yet, the, as, as, as huge as the need is, that isn't really what sells it completely. That's really not what pushes us over the edge. Here's what pushes us over the edge. An intimate relationship with Christ where we realize he gave everything to save us. We could never pay him back. We could never pay it forward. Doesn't work that way. He's done everything for us. We love him. We've received his forgiveness. We've received his grace. And in everything we have at that point, we are all in. It's all his. Every penny, every car, every stitch of clothing, every house, every, my job, my kids, it's all his. It's all his. Radical generosity. Let's read the story again quickly. Look at verse 41. And Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. 
And he called his disciples and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in, say it out loud with me, she's put in everything she had. How about that? All she had to live on, she put it in there. She gave generously. This is radical generosity. This is, this is most likely in 2013, this is the kind of generosity it's going to take to reach our planet with the gospel. Because there are millions of Christians in North America that, uh, now quite frankly, the way our economy is going and, and with, with challenges we have uh, with our government and all that, many people don't have as much as they used to have. And many of us are worried about whether we're going to have a job. So vote on Tuesday. But once you're done with that and you have an abundance, which many of us do, probably all of us have an abundance compared to 95% of the rest of the world, radically, generously Give. Now, this is what this woman does with two copper coins. I did some research on this. These copper coins were worth one 128th, one 128th of a denarius. A denarius was a day's work, what you were paid for a wage, the wage you were paid for a day's work. So these copper coins were worth one 128th of a day's work. So here's the question today. Who are you more like? Who am I more like? Who is the North American church more like? The widow or the scribes? Or the ones, the Pharisees, and the ones that were making a big deal about all they were giving? Who are you more like? You know, some Christians are not even willing to give out of their surplus. That's so sad. You're only robbing yourself when you rob God. This woman gave all. She was all in. And I want to challenge you today to ask God, what more he wants you to do. What does that look like for you? Because I've thought about this. You know, it's not about, you know, selling your house and living out on the street. God doesn't probably want you to do that, most likely. God doesn't want us to do anything that's going to hurt ourselves. His will for our lives is for our own good and for his glory. I don't know what he's going to ask you to do. I don't know what he's going to ask me to do. But everything we have, we should see it as his. And everything we're going to get, we should see it in terms of how can it further his kingdom. Are, are you a radically generous person? That's convicting to me. Am I a radically generous person? When you love Jesus, it produces radical generosity. In closing this morning, I, I want to just tell you about Green. Green is my friend. And some of you may know him. Many of you don't. But Green's a good man. I met him when he was 80. He's got to be in his early... He's, early to mid-80s now. Green's very involved in conservative Christian issues in the city of Richmond. In fact, his company built that balcony. The, comp the, the balcony that you're sitting in or sitting under, his company is the one we paid to build it, I think, 13 years, 15 years ago. Got an email from Green talking about some important issues, important to his heart and, and important to the cause. And, um, but at the end of it, it said, and please pray for me, I, I, uh, I've been diagnosed with lymphoma. This is last week when I read that. And it broke my heart to read that because he's a good man and he loves the Lord. He's been here before. He's spoken to you before. It's with the Virginia Christian Alliance. And it really bothered me to hear that news. It made me sad. It, it, I get, maybe I took it more personally because my own father is battling cancer right now. And, and I love Green. And I just wonder, who's going to take his place? When it comes to issues like pro-life, pro-marriage, procreation is one of his favorites. Who's going to take his place? Even, and we're praying that God will heal him. I believe that God can and will heal him of this lymphoma, but, but one day he's not going to be around anymore. And I, and I think about, and, and, and one day in the, in, in, in the near future, 10, 15, 20 years, he's not going to be around anymore. A lot of us might not be around anymore. And, and, and is our love for Jesus and our example being passed on to the next generation, one that says, you know what? I will live for Christ. I'm willing to die for Christ. I'm willing to lose my job for Christ. I'm willing to give up everything I have for Christ radical generosity, loving him to the point where I would die for him and having a friendship with him. Man, if, you, if you've had a best friend, you know, you, you, that's probably one of the definitions of a best friend, somebody I would be willing to die for because I love him that much. The question I have for you this morning is, are you all in? Do you love Jesus that way? What needs to begin today? Think about that old hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus, man. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. He's awesome. He's my best friend. 
He's done everything for me. Without him, I'm nothing. Without him, I can do nothing. And I just want to encourage you. The invitation is very direct. Here's my prayer, God. I'm all in. I'm all in. Would you pray that? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And we're going to bring our service to a conclusion. What a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. He's forgiven me. He's put up with me. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me, sook me. Christian, I want you to grapple with where you are. Lord, I'm all in. If you want to pray at the altar today, please help yourself. If you want to join our church or request baptism or make any decisions, coming forward and do that. But, but I'm hoping your prayer will be, Lord, I'm all in. It's all yours. And if you want to come and confirm that at the altar, you do that. You can do it where you're seated. It doesn't really matter where you are. It's your heart. But to be all in starts <laughs> with getting in. And that's what I want to focus on in the next 90 seconds. You are here, and you're not 100% sure that Jesus really is your friend. You've heard about him. You like him. You believe in God. But, but the truth is, you've never entered into a relationship with him. Maybe you've gone to church. Maybe you don't go to church. I, I don't think that's what God's going to ask you when you stand before him. Did you go to Kingsland? Did you go to some other church? Were you a good Catholic? Were you a good Methodist? No. When you stand before a holy God one day, the only thing that's going to matter is were your sins forgiven? Was Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord? So today I want to invite you to make a decision to invite Christ into your life. That's our invitation first and foremost. And this may just be for one or two or three. You're worth it. You're worth the attention. There's people praying for you right now as you grapple with what the Holy Spirit's doing in, in your heart. Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody will open up the door and, and let me in, I'll come and have fellowship with him. I'll be his friend. Doesn't matter how old you are or what your background is. It really doesn't matter. With everyone's heads bowed and everyone's eyes closed, please don't worry about anybody else. This is, this is about you right now. Do you want to invite Jesus Christ into your life? Do you want to give him your life and ask him to save you right now? It's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. Our sin is why we die. Our sin separates us from God. And ultimately when we die with sin in our lives, he can't have anything to do with us. That sin condemns us to hell. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. It's a free gift. It costs Jesus everything, but he gives it to you freely. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you will call on the name of the Lord right now, he'll save you. And uh, if you're really doing that, you don't really need for me to give you certain words to say, but, but I'm going to help you because I, maybe, maybe you're wondering, what, exactly how do I do this? Well, first of all, you need to believe that he died for you and he rose from the dead. Easter's not just a holiday, it's real. Jesus died for you because someone had to pay a penalty for that sin you've committed. And if you're not willing to admit you have sin in your life, you are not savable. The first thing you have to do is admit you have sin in your life that needs to be forgiven. But believe that he died for you. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to come into your heart right now. Don't let anything distract you. This is important. It's the most important thing we've done all day, right now. I'm so serious about this. I'm going to give you words to pray. Please think about the words before you say them. Make this your prayer to God in your heart. You don't have to stand up or pray out loud or anything like that. Don't, don't worry about all that. Worry about you and your standing with God right now. Here's some words you can pray. And, 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 and make this your own. God, I need you in my life. Lord Jesus, I want you to be my friend. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that your blood was shed for me that only your blood can wash away my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave. I believe. Lord, would you come into my heart right now and save me? Lord, would you forgive me? I want you to be my master. I want you to be my savior. I give my life to you right now. Boy, let that settle in for a second. Lord, Come in and save me. Be my master. Take full control of my life. I wonder if anybody prayed that prayer this morning. I'd ask you to continue with your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for their, just for their privacy, for this, for this moment. 
following Christ is a public thing. And we'll give you an opportunity to be baptized publicly and live for him publicly, but right now, just between you and me and God, I wonder if one person, I wonder if somebody just said yes to Jesus and made the Lord Jesus Christ their friend. I wonder if you just invited Christ in your life. Would you, would you raise your hand quickly? Let me know. I want to rejoice with you. Yes, I just prayed and received Christ as my Savior. Raise your hand where I can see it. Anybody like that today? Give you just another moment. Did anybody pray and invite Christ into your heart this morning? If so, as a testimony, raise your hand. Well, folks, we have a big job to do, don't we? And we can't do it based on guilt or based on trying to pay God back or any of that other stuff. It has to be the overflow of an intimate relationship with Christ, a deep love for Jesus and a deep love for others. We have an entire community who desperately needs the Lord, and it's our job to share the love of Jesus with them. That happens when we're all in. Radical generosity is the overflow of someone who says, man, I'm all in. A rejection of, the, of, the, of religiosity is the overflow of someone who says, I love Jesus. Not, not religion. I love Jesus, not this building. I love the church that he died to save and the, and the, and the lost people that he died, died to save. So today I would say, are you all in? And I would encourage you to take that to the Lord now and say, Lord Jesus, yes, I'm all in. Count me in. And Lord, I say that this morning knowing the sin, knowing the disobedience, knowing the frailty of my own human, humanity. But Lord, I say I'm, I'm in. I'm all in. Whatever you want, it's all yours. And Lord, I say that on behalf of my, my wife and my family. Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Lord, we say that on behalf of this church, this church family. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, come what may. And Lord, I pray for individuals in this room this morning who will say, I'm all in. I'm all in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing? If I can pray for you, if you want to pray by yourself, if you have a decision you need to make, this is your invitation to make that decision. Come as God leads. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid
Lord. Have a seat. Um, what an awesome song. I just, I just prayed with Terry, who's come and, and requested membership in our church. She got saved here as a little girl. She got baptized by Pastor Frank Lapeer many, many years ago. And today she's come back to Kingsland, and we just prayed. And I thought, you know, it's awesome to think that all these years later, we're still here singing Amazing Grace. And, and, and seeing God's grace extended to people. How cool is that? Terry, just wave your hand so everybody knows who you are. Make sure you meet her before you leave. She's been saved. She's been baptized. And um, we will start a new uh, KBC orientation class here in the next few weeks for her and anyone else that wants to, to get more information and be a part of our church family. And uh, while I'm saying this, I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward. Nancy's come forward, and um, she's asked for prayer for her physical body. She's getting ready for some um, surgeries. And um, you, if you don't know James and Nancy already, you're missing out. You've got to get to know these guys. They're awesome. James was my partner last week, going all over the neighborhood, passing out flyers. And, and um, he has uh, recently nailed down his salvation decision I think the day Pastor Derek preached here a few weeks ago and and today he's requested baptism so how great is that you may be thinking about the same things you may be wondering about the same things but but in all reality you're you're scared to walk down the aisle I don't blame you it's scary um, so if, if you want to talk to somebody come talk to me after. And um, Terry, would you voice a prayer for this sweet lady? We have a problem. We just ask for your guidance. We ask for your wisdom and we ask for your healing power. So we just pray that you be with all and be with Nancy. And she goes forward to through this time. We pray for her health. We pray for her. Just to go as a routine. We pray that there are problems. So we pray for the patience and we pray for mm -hmm. the peace and the calm that only you can provide. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss our service, I just want to one more time say thank you to all of our guests. Um, first time guest here for Friend Day. You made it the whole day. Thank you for being here. And uh, we do uh, have a lunch prepared for all of our newcomers. And that would be anybody that's new. If, if you're new to Kingsland, go across the street and have lunch with us. If you're in question as to whether or not that's you, just go and eat. We got lots of salad and soup and just go. We want you to come. And if you brought a friend today, please go with them. Um, if you're not taking them to Roos Chris or whatever, um, just come eat with us. And we're just glad each and every one of you were with us today. And I hope you at least got a bulletin so you can be aware of what's going on. We have Upward this Saturday uh, coming up. We have the SBCV Homecoming in Roanoke we're making plans for. And um, several other, other items in the bulletin to just be prepared for, be knowledgeable of. And um, boy, it's just been a great day. Thank, thank you, James and Nancy. And I look forward to baptizing you. Thank you, Terry, for coming back. Uh, Terry, I'd ask that you and Dorothy would stand with Terry after we, after we pray. Come up and get to know her before you leave. And uh, all of our newcomers, uh, please come have lunch with us across the street in the front of the gym, okay? Lord, I pray that you'd take us out of here in peace. I pray that you'd take us out of here with joy in our hearts and energy and enthusiasm to, 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 to share your love with others and to live lives of generosity. Lord, help us to, to grow closer with you each and every day, to be all in. Lord, that's the kind of people we want to be in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.